Welcome to worship. Wherever you are as you view this service, the land you are on has a history and, most likely, traditional stewards who have a long, long history with the land. This service was recorded on the lands of Treaty 7. We acknowledge that and pray that the spirit of reconciliation and new life will accompany our path forward. You, watching at home, are encouraged to acknowledge and pray for the place where you are right now and for the traditional knowledge keepers and stewards of that place. In this time of worship, we also express our commitment as affirming congregations, both Ralph Connor and Wendell, as we seek to truly live into our highest intentions to be places of welcome, safety, and joy for all. Good morning. When Jesus gathered his disciples, divine light shone in their midst as they came to understand God's mission and presence amongst them. As those seeking to be disciples of Jesus in our time and place, we welcome that same light into this time of worship as we light this Christ candle. Thanks be to God. Amen. From the Christ candle, we light a peace candle which expresses our hope for peace in the world, in the Ukraine and all nations blighted by war, and in all places where inequality breaks the possibility of peace. Our scripture reading today is taken from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 12, verses 13 to 21, from the Good News Bible. The Parable of the Rich Fool. A man in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, tell my brother to divide with me the property our father left us. And Jesus answered him, My friend, who gave me the right to judge or to divide the property between you two? And he went on to say to them all, Watch out and guard yourselves from every kind of greed because a person's true life is not made up of the things he owns, no matter how rich he may be. And Jesus told them this parable. There was once a rich man who had land which bore good crops. He began to think to himself, I haven't anywhere to keep all my crops. What can I do? Well, this is what I will do, he told himself. I will tear down my barns and build bigger ones where I will store my corn and all my other goods. Then I will say to myself, lucky man, you have all the good things you need for many years. Take life easy, eat, drink, and enjoy yourself. But God said to him, you fool, the very night you will have to give up your life. And then who will get all these things you have kept for yourself? And Jesus concluded, This is how it is with those who pile up riches for themselves, but are not rich in God's sight.
the day, at the time I was preparing this message, a friend in the Okanagan Valley area of BC emailed me with a message that he had just spotted his first forest fire of the season. And he attached a photo of a huge plume of rising smoke, 12 kilometers, he said, from his house. To me, it was a visual reminder that the wildfire season is again upon us. And it seems to me with each passing year, these fires seem to grow in frequency and intensity with the increasing loss of property, possessions, and regrettably, lives. I think most of us remember last summer's fires were especially severe in parts of North America, in our own country of Canada. We saw images of families being awakened in the middle of the night, stirred from their beds with mere minutes to scoop up a few precious personal treasures to flee the racing inferno. And that caused me, friends, to ponder. I asked myself, what would I have saved in a similar situation? I have a lot of stuff. I have too much, too much stuff. And I couldn't decide what to take, what to leave behind, and what would be enough to carry with me. Natural disasters like these remind us that everything in the world is temporary that when I'm gone, most of my stuff will be outdated, perhaps worn out, and of little value to anyone else. That's why I can say with Jesus in our text today that life is not defined by what we have, even when we have a lot. Would you agree with that statement? Yet all the time in our culture, we're given messages that deplore this message that Enough is enough. It leads us to seek more and more. It continually assaults us with the message that our life is defined by the things we have. If we had a little more, we'd be happier. If we had that thing we don't currently have, we'd be more fulfilled. We say we believe in Jesus' words that our lives do not consist of what we have, but often we live as though they do. A psychologist has said that many of us suffer from a modern disease, a disease called affluenza. Which brings us to the story from Luke. The story of the foolish rich farmer. He has a super abundant crop one year. And he says to himself, what should I do with it? There's no space for such an extraordinary harvest. And he decides, therefore, to pull down all his current barns and build larger ones, more than big enough to store all the grain he has, so that in his retirement, he can relax, he can be at ease and comfort. God shows up, and God has little regard for his greedy plans. God says to him, fool, tonight you will die, and your barn full of goods, who gets it? Sisters and brothers, the question is this, when is enough enough? Are you contented with what you have right now? If not, what can you, what can I, what can we do about it? The Apostle Paul, I think, is an excellent example of one totally contented with life. He wrote this in one of his letters. I don't have a sense of needing anything personally. I've learned how to be quite content, whatever my circumstances. I'm just as happy with a little as with much with much as with little. I found the recipe for being happy, whether full or hungry, hands full or hands empty. Paul had learned to be happy with enough. And remember, he wrote these words from a prison cell in Rome while he was awaiting the news of his fate. Friends, like Paul, I think we too can learn to be content in whatever circumstances we find ourselves. And here, I share with you a few thoughts on cultivating greater contentment in our lives. First of all, and it may sound trite, remember that it could be worse. I try to do this myself. I recall saying these four words, it could be worse. After I toured my Muslim friend Mahmoud Ashad's custom kitchen manufacturing shop in Northeast Calgary, where he makes the highest end product for high end homes. I took a tour of his manufacturing plant. I saw his beautiful, large, 
showroom, and I came home to my tired, 20-year-old melamine cupboards with chips, discoloration, and the rippled linoleum flooring. And I said, "Well, God, I thank you for this little home. It's ours. <laughs> It could be worse." It's recognizing, I believe, that no matter what we may not like about something or someone or some circumstance we find ourselves in, we can always find something worthy to focus on, if we choose to do it. If we choose to do it, it could be worse. Secondly, ask yourself, how long will this thing, whatever it is, make me happy? I try to do that as well. Often we buy something thinking it'll make us happy, only to find that happiness lasts as long as it takes to free it from its box and assemble it. The moments of satisfaction, as we fantasize about having it, making the purchase, soon dissipate. There's many things I've found we buy that are simply not worth the expense. <laughs> When I was contemplating retirement, I attended a workshop. I wanted to be ready, and the Facilitator began by saying, "This, you know, everyone in this room knows one thing. You all know what you're retiring from, but how many of you know what you're retiring to?" He said, "I see too many people. The first year they retire, they sell their home in Calgary, they buy a condo, on a resort in a resort in some tropical location, only to discover that retirement is not one long extended golf weekend." He said, "Try it out for all four seasons. See how you like it. See how happy you are there, especially in the heat, the blazing heat of summer." And so, what I try to do sometimes is, before I think something is worth having, I try to borrow someone's new gadget and see how it feels. We stop and ask ourselves sometimes, "How long will this make me happy?" Third, and importantly, I say this: cultivate. A grateful heart. You know, our spiritual hearts, like any physical muscle, need to be exercised regularly and consistently. Again, I point to the words of Paul. He said this: "Give thanks in all circumstances." What he was saying is, flex that muscle of gratitude, that heart of gratitude, regularly and consistently. That an attitude of gratitude is essential if we're to be content with our lives. About seven months ago, I faced a life-threatening medical situation in my life, and they were unsure if I would survive initially. But miraculously, I did. I remember when I was discharged from the hospital and I came home. The moment I stepped over the threshold, I was flooded with an overwhelming sense of deep gratitude. A sense that has not left me since, and I wanted to practice it, to flex it daily. As I daily practice expressing and releasing it to God, as I did that, I was it was joined by the twin emotion of contentment, contentment. I began to declutter my life physically. I remodeled my home study, which I'd always wanted to do. I got rid of my beloved books. Many of them had been with me for a long time. My precious books. Sorted through my clothes. We got rid of household items, praying that someone else would appreciate me blessed as much as I had with them. And as we did that, as I did that, especially, it released a greater sense of contentment. Now you don't have to endure some traumatic event like I did. We can practice that as our feet hit the floor in the morning for just a few seconds. We need to cultivate grateful hearts. And finally, this final thing: ask yourself. Where does my soul find true satisfaction in life? Our culture says we find it in ease and security and certainty, but we know that our restless hearts, sisters and brothers, were meant to seek after God. That contentment comes through a deep, abiding relationship with God and others. In the end, our relationships are all we have to treasure. I close with this story. The story is told by a man named Bob Perks. He's a well-known inspirational author who often writes about uh, uh, events and people he's connected with along the way. He tells a beautiful story of being at the airport once. As he was sitting there, he overheard a father and daughter in their last moments of 
a farewell. And then the announcement of her departure gate came, and everyone standing near the security gate was ready to pass through. The father hugged her tenderly and said something, he says, that gave me pause. He said this to his daughter, I love you, and I wish you enough. And that was it. She said, Dad, our life together has been much more than enough. I love you too, and your love is all I ever needed. I wish you enough too. As she departed through the gate, Perk said he was, saw the man standing there watching her go, and he could see he was about to cry. He didn't want to pry, but then the man turned to him and with tears in his eyes said, have you ever had to say goodbye to someone knowing it's forever? And Perk said, yes, my father. And he thought about the time that he took his father's, his dying father's face in his hands and told him he loved him. And then Perks went on, forgive me for asking, he said, but why is this a forever goodbye? And the father said, my daughter's off to a new life overseas, and I'm dying, everybody knows it. And the next time she's back home will be for my funeral. Perks said, I have a curious mind. I said, when you were saying goodbye, I overheard you say, I wish you enough. What's that all about? And he smiled. He said, that's a wish our family has handed down from generation to generation. It's wanting the other person to have a life filled with just enough things that will fulfill them. And then he recited this poem he had memorized. I'll share it with you. It says this, I wish you enough sun to keep your attitude bright. I wish you enough rain. I wish, en sorry, I wish you enough happiness to keep your spirit alive. I wish you enough pain and suffering that your smallest joys in life will appear even bigger. I wish you enough gain. I wish you enough gain to satisfy your wanting. I wish you enough loss to appreciate all that you have. I wish you enough hellos to get you through the final goodbye. He then wiped away a few more tears and walked to the exit. And as he did, he turned and said to me, I wish you enough. Friends, may God bless you, and I wish you enough. Amen. Let us join our hearts and minds in a time of prayer. 
O oh God, we pray. We pray for those parts of the world where there is war and unrest. For those in Ukraine, Afghanistan, Yemen, Palestine, and so many other places where there is no peace. We pray that you will hear the cries of those who are frightened, that you will strengthen and inspire those who work for peace, and that you will help us to be people of peace ourselves. We pray for justice, O oh God, that in this land and across the world, leaders will be inspired by the Spirit to act fairly and wisely for the common good, and that our institutions would be guided and renewed by those seeking to hear your voice. We pray for those in times of transition, changes in health, relationship, employment, those who struggle to find adequate housing, those addressing addictive or other unhelpful patterns of living. And we pray for our church, that at times of change and uncertainty, we will be a place of refuge and peace in our communities, while also being fully engaged with the issues of people's lives. In a busy and troubled world, May we have wisdom and compassion. These and all our prayers we bring in Jesus' name. Amen. This time of prayer comes to a close with these words of blessing. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all this day and forevermore. Amen.